the Seventh-day Adventist Church is now at the crossroads of what may prove to be the biggest crisis of unity and mission in our 150-year history. This crisis is more than a question of women pastors, but really a question of how we will read and follow the Bible in the future. It is not surprising that thinking Christians would wonder why talented, God-fearing women would not be allowed to be ordained as pastors. In a culture where the media scoffs at organized religion and celebrates same-sex marriage, we should not be surprised if the lines of gender differences and biblical authority seem fuzzy. If a woman feels called to serve as an ordained minister, why should a church block her chosen career path? Without biblical authority and a divine precedent, there would be no logical reason to prevent women from being ordained as ministers. For that matter, neither would there be any reason to keep the seventh day of the week holy. However, as historic defenders of biblical truth, Seventh-day Adventists must not allow culture to shape our doctrinal stand on issues such as creation, abortion, same-sex relationships, or women's ordination. It is interesting to consider that after 6,000 years of human history, some Christians are now seeking to change the divine plan in this area. So, the question remains, is the spiritual headship for females biblical? Note some basic biblical facts regarding male headship. 1. Adam was formed first from the dust of the ground. Genesis clearly shows Adam as the one who was to care for the garden, identifies the animals, and names his wife. 2. After Adam and Eve sinned, it was Adam, not Eve, that the Lord called to account for the sin, even though Eve was the first to sin. This is why Jesus came as the second Adam, to win back the lost dominion and headship Adam had surrendered to Satan through disobedience. 3. Only men are ever recorded in the Bible as officiating in the offering of sacrifices or called to priestly ministry. 4. The founders of the twelve tribes of Israel were all men. 5. Although the Lord called on the entire nation of Israel to be a kingdom of priests, only men were appointed to offer the Passover lamb and to later serve as priests. 6. The twelve rulers appointed by Moses in the wilderness under God's direction were only men. 7. The seventy elders appointed by Moses were all male. 8. Only men were anointed by God to serve as kings of Israel and Judah. 9. All patriarchal blessings were passed down from father to son. 10. The Old and New Testaments trace the genealogy of Jesus through the male lineage. 11. There are seven examples in Scripture of women giving birth in connection with a miracle. All these miracle babies that typified Christ were male children. 12. Although Jesus desired that women share the good news of salvation, he only called men to serve in the capacity of apostles. 13. Both men and women were baptized, but only by men. 14. The first seven deacons chosen to administrate the early Christian church were all men. 15. Paul, who said that, in Christ there is neither male or female, went from town to town and only ordained men. We must keep in mind that it was Jesus who created Adam and established male headship in a perfect pre-fall world. This reveals the eternal nature of this divine arrangement. Any compromise of the foundational principles found in Genesis paves the way for a future compromise on issues like the Sabbath, same-sex marriage, and evolution. The controversy over headship first began in heaven, with Lucifer questioning the divine order in the Godhead. Lucifer resented and eventually rejected the headship of Christ, which thrust the universe into a crisis over this very question. Did Eve have equal headship with Adam at creation? If the answer is no, it should remain so forever. Any attempt to change this order would be similar to Lucifer's attempt to grasp equal authority with Christ. God set up spiritual headship in Adam, and he follows the same creation pattern down through time. Priesthood, kingship, apostleship, eldership, all male. Jesus never established a gender-equal priesthood or established female apostleship for his new church body. When the sacrificial system was swept away and all that pertained to it, Jesus still established male headship to run his church. Interesting.
Had Jesus established women as apostles and leaders of spiritual Israel, no one would be questioning women's ordination today. The Apostle Paul said that, in Christ, there is neither male or female. If this means that women should be ordained to spiritual headship, it must always have been true, even from creation. But is that what the biblical record shows? The Apostle Paul reaffirms this divine plan in 1 Corinthians 11.3. I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. In the church, ordination to pastoral ministry entitles a person to move into the positions of male spiritual headship. If we ordain women, female headship is likewise instituted. This is something that Jesus never gave authority to do. It makes no sense, then, for the world church to deliberately vote to approve what God has clearly disallowed by His divine right. Some are urging a third way, or compromise solution, that promotes the idea that each division may independently decide what they will do regarding women's ordination. They are seeking a compromise on this issue because they realize the majority of the world church members would likely support the historic position of male ordination. But this kind of compromise can only be achieved at the expense of biblical authority and a united mission within the body of Christ. It is a significant point to note that all of the major Protestant denominations, such as Lutherans, Methodists, Anglicans, Presbyterians, that changed their theology on women's ordination have experienced internal divisions and decreased membership. Furthermore, every denomination that now ordains gay clergy first began by ordaining female pastors. The methods of biblical interpretation used to justify women's ordination are also used to approve same-sex relationships. Many examples can already be cited, where pastors who don't support women's ordination are marginalized in union or conference that are promoting the new theology. Typically, the divisions pushing for women's ordination are the most affluent, while at the same time being the most evangelistically stagnant. The poorer nations, with the fastest church growth, do not support a change in our biblical stand on women's ordination. The third way would essentially divide the church along economic lines and could preclude financial support to those poorer divisions that did not come into line on the women's ordination issue. The world church would then become fragmented by division and no longer be the unified biblical model established by Christ himself. Now, more than ever, as we approach the final events of Earth's history, the church needs to be united, not divided, biblically based, not culturally driven. For more information on the Bible and women's ordination, visit www.ordinationtruth.com.